so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Shao Shaimo. Uh, I'm a co-director of uh, the Center for ICOM with Professor Shias, the other co-director. So the Center for ICOM was launched a year and a half ago with the aim of enhancing research and educational collaboration in the area of autonomous and uh, kind of system. Uh, especially we uh, the, uh, we want to uh, introduce expertise, not just from uh, classical theories in control optimization networks, but also uh, uh, recent ones in machine learning, AI, and data science. So uh, since uh, a year and a half ago, we started the ICON seminar series. And from last semester, we start uh, the, 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 the seminars and each semester will be uh, with a topic. Uh, last semester was um, human robot teaming. And this semester, uh, we, we more like uh, organize the seminars in, within the topic of learning for autonomy uh, by our uh, uh, new faculty, Masha and our uh, Fazo. So I will turn to Masha to introduce our speaker. Yeah, it's my pleasure to have Professor Ray Pan here today. Um, Dr. Ray Pan is currently an assistant professor at the Department of Cognitive Robotics. Delk University of Technology. He received a PhD degree from Imperial College London in 2016. Before coming to the Netherlands, he was a project leader at DJI China. He is the recipient of Dorothy Hodgkin's Postgraduate Awards, Microsoft Research PhD Scholarship, and Chinese Government Award for Outstanding Students Abroad. He is on the editorial board of Corel, IPRA, IRAS, IEEE Robotics, and Automation Letters. Without further ado, I invite Wei to start us talk. All right, thanks. Thanks for the nice introduction and thanks for Xiao Shui for the invitation. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. Um, right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Let me start. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for the invitation, and uh, thanks, uh, Marcia, for the nice introduction. And I'm currently in the Netherlands. Well, maybe I should say uh, good evening to everyone. And my research is about uh, a control of robots. And uh, there are quite some talks and works on reinforcement learning or deep reinforcement learning for robot control. Today, I'm going to talk about the Bayesian method of reinforcement learning for robot control. By using the Bayesian method, we can give safety related guarantees, such as stability and some hard constraints guarantee. Okay, here's the outline of my talk. First, I will give some background of safe learning in robotics and the reinforcement learning. Then I will introduce the technical details of a Bayesian method. And finally, I will show some examples, including both simulation and real world demos. Okay. Robots are everywhere in Delft, in the Netherlands, and the robotic research is everywhere in Delft. Robots are working for the people and are working with people. For all these robotic applications, safety is crucial. And for all these robotic applications, we need to design reliable robot control systems. And my research group is focusing on machine learning for robot control. We work with different robots, for example, ground vehicles, drones, and a space robot. And for all these examples shown here, we are using Bayesian reinforcement learning to design robot controllers to ensure safety guarantees such as stability, collision avoidance, and some other constraints. Today, I will introduce some of our recent work on Bayesian reinforcement learning for robot control and with safety guarantees. Before I delve into the technical details, first, I will give a quick overview of safe learning in robotics. Recently, Angela's group from the University of Toronto published a review paper on safe learning in robotics. I agree with very much with this paper. And in this paper, they define safety levels on three levels. So at the highest level, level three, the system has to satisfy hard constraints. And at level two, the system has to satisfy probabilistic constraints. And at the lowest level, the system are encouraged soft constraints. And also this paper systematically reviewed approaches for safe learning control in robotics in several categories highlighted with different colors here. 
based on the complexity of the model or prior knowledge about the system dynamics, from known dynamics to unknown dynamics. And it includes the standard control approaches, which span all the safety levels. It also includes the standard reinforced learning method, which basically there's no guarantee at all. We can move a little bit further to encourage the safety to encourage safety and robustness to reinforce learning. And we can move a little bit furthermore to safely learn the uncertain dynamics. And then in between, we have a safe model-based reinforced learning. At the highest level, the system can offer system can offer safety certificate, including stability and a constraint set. And today in this talk, I will target safety level three, certifying learning-based control under dynamics uncertainty. And I want to move closer to the final goal of certifying reinforcement learning with these guarantees, either with or without using a mathematical model. Okay, before presenting the theoretical result, we have to answer two set of questions or maybe four questions here. So the first set of questions are, what is and how to obtain the mathematical model? The second set of questions are, what are and how to obtain the certificates? Well, to answer the first set of questions regarding the modeling, we need to know what the model looks like. Typically, the system is modeled as a differential equation or difference equation. There are two ways of get to, the, to get the model. One is to use the first principle, for example, like Newton's law to get a system equation. Well, the other way is to learn the model using some input and output data known as system identification or model learning. And we have done some work on system identification by using the Bayesian method and applied it to different systems. For example, from physics to anthropology and also the fault diagnosis problem of high voltage transmission network and some hybrid systems as well as the nonlinear system identification benchmark. Well, it should be noted that this nonlinear system identification benchmark is very popular in the Netherlands and the Belgium because due to um, some historical reasons uh, on the nonlinear system identification uh, research here. And our work on the Bayesian method of system identification is related to the model based Bayesian reinforcement learning. Well, you can use the uncertainty of the parameter to update the policy search in order to find the optimal policy, try to balance or compromise the exploration and exploitation. So there's no such dilemma in the model based Bayesian reinforcement learning. However, I will not talk about the system identification today. Today, I want to focus if we are given a model, a simulator, or just some raw sensor data, how to control the system. Now we have answered the first set of questions regarding the modeling, right? Let's answer the second set of questions. What are and how to obtain the certificate? Typically, we are given the system by a differential equation or difference equation with the equilibrium at origin, and we can offer stability certificate. Typically, we are using the function, which is a scalar function and a positive, and we hope that the derivative of the optimal function over time is non-positive. And also the difference is non-positive for discrete time system. And similarly, we can have the control of the optimal function. Well, you don't have to define explicitly the feedback control law. You can just evaluate the actions and we make sure this derivative over time is non-positive. Uh, and furthermore, we can have the safety certificate by using the barrier functions. So the barrier functions is also a scalar function and for some initial safe state, so this barrier function is non-positive and for some unsafe regions, the barrier function is positive and similar to the Lyapunov function, the derivative of the barrier function over time is positive or with the difference is non-positive, uh, non positive. sorry. And similar to the control Lyapunov barrier function, we can have the control barrier function and we are evaluating the actions and make sure this derivative is non-positive. We can also unify the stability and the safety certificate and get the control Lyapunov barrier function, which is the positive scalar function. And in some safe regions, it's smaller equal than C, some constant. And when it's in the unsafe region, it's greater than C. And then we evaluate the actions and make sure the derivative is non-positive. Well, what I introduced here is just a nutshell and maybe oversimplified or even not rigorous. For example, in the Lyapunov function case for the zero, 
it is often substituted by a minus class kappa function. And the zero here for the barrier function is often substituted with the minus extended class kappa infinity function. So the idea I want to show here is that the safety related certificates are kind of a bunch of inequalities. Okay, now we know what are the certificates, then how to get these certificates. Well, unfortunately, you have to handmade your certificate. It is notoriously known that it's very difficult. And luckily, and recently, there are some work showing you that you can actually learn the certificate from data if we are given the mathematical model, okay? For example, like in this case, neural Lyapunov control, the authors try to minimize the empirical Lyapunov function risk by drawing some samples. So the right loop function here is to showing or drawing the connections between the constraints in the equalities. And in this paper, actually from Xiao Shui, and they are trying to combine the Lyapunov function and the barrier function by minimizing the Lyapunov-like risk and the barrier function like risk and drawing samples and about also using the right loop functions to uh, transform the inequalities uh, of the, in, uh, the inequalities uh, in the certificate in the cost of function. And in this paper, they are trying to combine or propose a unified control the upper barrier function and by drawing samples. Until now, we always assume we have a mathematical model of the system. What if we have unknown dynamics for example, we just are given a simulator or just a, some raw sensor data. How to do that? How to design the controller? Well, reinforcement learning is a promising approach to learn controllers with unknown dynamics from data. So what is reinforcement learning? Well, in the reinforcement learning framework, there's an agent, there's an environment. Well, the environment can be the robot and the environments are interacting with the agent. And through such interactions, the agents begin to learn the policy or which is optimal to control the environment. And typically the environment is modeled as a markup decision process or some partial observable markup decision process and so on and so forth. And we have the state action transition dynamics and we have the action value function Q, which is an expectation of the sum of the discount reward for the future. And we have the state value function, which is the, is the expectation of this Q function over some actions, which is sampled from policy pi. And we have the advantage function, which is the difference of the action value function Q and state value function V. And we have our objective, which is expected reward. And our goal is to find a policy pi, which can be promised by some parameter theta to maximize our objective, the expected reward. How to solve the reinforcement learning problem? We can rewrite the objective function as the Bellman equations and use the dynamical programming. We can derive the optimal policy using the Bellman optimality equation, typically using the like value iteration algorithms or policy iteration algorithms. Well, these methods are value function based method. An alternative approach for solving MDP is to directly search in the space of policies, or you can combine the value function method and a policy search method and came up with the actor critic method. Well, you simultaneously learn the value function and the policy. Besides the category of the reinforcement learning solutions by the algorithms, the other category is based on the use of the model. Typically in the model based RL, the model is not available, but it is explicitly learned from experience using some model learning or system identification techniques. Then the model will be used for planning. Then interacting with the environment through some actions to, to collect more samples to update the model. And in model free reinforcement learning, the model is not available and is not explicitly learned through actions with the environment and the value function and the policy will be learned. Why am I talking about a Bayesian method of reinforcement learning? You can just use the vanilla reinforcement learning to control robots. And there are so many videos, demos, and interesting applications just using the reinforcement learning per se, not using the Bayesian method. Well, Bayesian reinforcement learning is very old. It can be traced back to the 1950s. Well, this is typically known as the posterior, this is the prior, this is the likelihood, and this integral is a normalized factor or known as the evidence. Well, indeed, it has some advantages. Well, the uncertainty can be fully captured that the probability distribution, and this is a natural optimization of the exploration and exploitation trade-off. And this is also a unifying framework for other learning frameworks. However, Still, the basic method 
are rarely used and that we barely heard any applications, I mean, real world applications, especially in robotics using basic reinforcement learning. Well, in my perspective, I think the challenge is there's no guidelines to place priors on what? On the model parameters, value function, or the policies. Well, challenge also means opportunity, right? Maybe we can have some good domain knowledge, for example, in the certificate to place priors on the value functions. Why not? Let's do that. So the idea is that I want to place Lyapunov function and a barrier function as priors. Okay, first of all, we're gonna specify the value function to be the Lyapunov function candidate. And furthermore, if you are care about a safety, you can specify the barrier function as this. And then the total value function gonna be the sum of the Lyapunov function and a barrier function. Then we can write it a bunch of inequalities as we can see in the certificate as a prior distribution to encode the distribution of the value function, right? Then we can use the Bayesian inference approach to get an estimate of this value function. And finally, if we can find a way to, that, to get a Q from V, then we can apply the policy search to get the optimal policy. Well, how can we do that? We can decompose our objective, the sum of the discounted reward as follows, starting from T equals zero. And furthermore, we decompose again, starting from T equals one. Then we do the subtraction on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, we get a following equation. Well, this is essentially temporal difference learning. And we can extend in a matrix form, we have the following representation. On the left-hand side is the observable process of the reward, and then we have the linear transformation matrix, and then we have the unknown function Q, and then we have some noise, then this is a regression problem, right? So we can solve that. Let's do something further by introducing the B matrix, which is called the first order difference equation or first order difference matrix over the value function V. If we, on the right-hand side, it is the time derivative. It's a time difference of, of V over time. Since we have specified the state value function as the Lyapunov function candidate, if this right-hand side is not positive, we actually have the stability certificate. Then we can have the constrained regression problem formulation. If we can solve both Q and the V, we are done. However, there are two problems. The first problem is V and Q are in the functional space. This is just, a, this, it is not just a number, right? And the V is in the constraint. Well, not a Q. And how to solve these problems? Well, let's make another round of the plan. We specify Q and the V as Gaussian process. And we, if we can easily derive Q from a V, that is the probability distribution of Q conditional on V, then we can use the Bayesian inference where PV encodes the sum of the inequalities, then we can get a certificate. If we get a Q, we can use the policy search to search the optimal policy. Okay, so we're gonna use the actor critic to learn the critic by using the Gaussian process temporal difference and the learned actor using Bayesian policy gradient. So what is the Gaussian process? So the Gaussian process definition is, there's an index set of joint Gaussian random variables. Suppose we have some input data X, we have an unknown function F. So F's distribution is specified by its mean and the covariance. And we can use, also use a conditional probability. Suppose we have two random variables jointly distributed according to the multiple variety normal distribution. We can derive the conditional distribution of Z over Y as follows, which is also Gaussian. Then we can easily solve the regression problem by placing a Gaussian process prior over Q. Okay, so far, so, so far, just pay attention, there's no constraint yet. Then we can solve that easily by deriving the posterior estimation of the expectation and the covariance as follows. Furthermore, how about we get the distribution of V over the data? We can split the Q function at the sum of the state value function V and advantage function A. Then we can denote this variable here. And by selecting such a kernel, which is the sum of the sum state kernel and the sum state action kernel, by some derivations, we can find that okay, the expectation of V over D is actually corresponding to this state kernel, 
while the advantage function is only corresponding to the state action kernel. So V is also Gaussian, and we can easily derive the covariance and the covariance of V with Q besides the expectation, right? Then we can easily derive Q from V. So we have the probability distribution of Q over V. Now let's move to the next step. Recall that we want to solve this constrained regression problem or the Gaussian process or the constrained Gaussian process regression problem. So actually, instead of putting a prior over V, we should consider BV. B is the first order difference matrix. And if we specify this prior and with B is a linear operator, so the BV is also Gaussian, then we can easily get the mean and the covariance and also get a cross covariance as follows. So the, now the idea is that if you consider the constraint case, so we have have a new Q besides the, con, besides the constraint and constraint case, right? So with these linear inequality constraints and also define CD, you know, the event that all the constraints satisfied, the posterior Gaussian distribution conditional on the data side reward and this constraint event can be described as follows. Then our idea is that, and our objective is we want to update this new Q hat. We want to know the posterior distribution for Q hat with some new data action pair. So the Q hat is actually a compound Gaussian with the truncated Gaussian mean. So that's the key here. So C is actually a truncated distribution. So what is a truncated Gaussian distribution? It's like you have a Gaussian distribution, right? So in this case, you only care about the negative part. You only care about the left-hand side without considering the right-hand side of this Gaussian distribution. All right. And by some derivations, we are repeatedly using the conditional distribution as follows. Then we can get the conditional, we can get the Q hat conditional on C and the reward as follows. And the C is the truncated Gaussian distribution. So we can see that we can see we can see that, that this new Q hat has a truncated, this truncated Gaussian distribution mean. All right. And we have, if we have a prior mean uh, mu hat at zero, so we can have the posterior predict the mean function and as it follows. And if you remember that we have an alpha here for this unconstrained case. So we have the new alpha hat here. So this is alpha minus something, minus some truncated Gaussian distribution and plus some state kernels multiply the B. And furthermore, this is actually only depends on the state kernel. So this is new V hat. And this is our Lie optimal function. And so far, we can say that, okay, we can do the Bayesian inference to get this V. Okay, let's move forward to learn the actor, to learn the policy by using the Bayesian policy gradient. If we are doing a policy gradient, we definitely should show the policy gradient theorem, which is very famous. So basically the policy gradient is expectation of this U multiplied the Q so the U is a skull function with this gradient of a log pi and the Q is just what we learned from the critic, right? Then we can use the Monte Carlo estimation to estimate the policy gradient. So simply by simply drawing some samples. However, there's a problem with the Monte Carlo estimation method because the variance is very high by doing the Monte Carlo simulation. Since we have specified the Q as a Gaussian process and actually there's an opportunity we can get a close form of the policy gradient by using the Bayesian quadrature. And we can simply derive the posterior moment as follows. Recall that we construct the kernel function as a sum of the state kernels and plus some state action kernels, right? So if the state action kernel is specified as a Fisher kernel, then we can get a closed form solution for the expectation of the policy gradient and the covariance as, as follows. And if you remember, this alpha is in the constraint case, then we can say, if we are using the constraint case, then we can derive the V hat conditional on this data side and the constraint side as follows. Then we can derive the policy gradient by simply using this quantity here. By, you, by using this quantity here as follows. Okay, so now we have the policy search using Q or this new Q hat. And of, of course, 
we can also unify the layer funnel with the barrier function as well. For example, if you consider both cases, we can specify two value functions and two state action value functions as well. So this V is responsible for the layer funnel function, and this V hat is responsible for the barrier function. Of course, you can add some additional constraints as shown in the certificate. And it also, we can have the control layer from bare function, which is as follows by adding such constraints in the certificate. And simply, we are, if we are given the model, that's a good idea, right? That's a good news. Then, for example, if the system is a control of fine form, we can also add these constraints, including the model information, as follows to solve the constraint regression problem. Okay, so far, I have introduced the theoretical result, we have introduced the algorithms. We have introduced the how we're going to solve this constrained regression problem by using the Gaussian process. And if luckily we get a V, V is our certificate. And also we can combine with the barrier function that acts, et cetera, to get even more certificates. OK, let's see how it works in the practice. The first of all, I'm going to show some simulation examples, including the couple control. So we test against the disturbances and the parametric uncertainties. We vary the mass of the pole as follows to test the robustness to parametric uncertainties. And furthermore, we change the disturbance torque to test the robustness to disturbances. In the second example, we consider hopper control and we change the light lines to test the, the robustness against the parametric uncertainties. And furthermore, we verify the disturbance torque to test the robustness to disturbances. We also consider Walker control. So we change the ratio of the calf to thigh lens and to test the robustness to parametric uncertainties. And we change the disturbance torque to test the robustness to disturbances. Okay, we also compared with model predictive control. And actually, we find this paper is quite interesting. We introduce or combine the control layout of barrier function. And in some similar examples, like a car tracking, a tra car trajectory tracking with a kinematic model, and a car trajectory tracking with a slight with a slight slip model, and also 3D quadrature hover, and 2D quadrature with collision avoidance, and the satellite rendezvous. And our method compared with this method and also test against the robust MPC method. So we can not only achieve very good safety rate and also control performance. So if you think about, okay, this kind of constrained control problem, right? So I think the first thing came up into my mind is model predict control, right? So we're trying to minimize or optimize uh, some of the cost in a finite horizon with some constraints regarding the dynamics of the model or some constraint on the state and some constraint on action and some initial state and some terminal state. And then we can solve the constraint problem easily and by using some efficient algorithms like a convex optimization and so on and so forth, right? But however, in the practice, model predictive control has some problems. For example, there's no guarantee on the safety and the stability beyond the linear case, and the model cannot be too complicated, and the constraint cannot be too complicated, and the model uncertainty cannot be too complicated, and also computational too expensive for high control frequency. So this is what the result shows. So if you increase the stopping rate, right? So, or increasing the stopping rate, the, the performance increases. So basically, if the control frequency is low, it's okay, but the one is high. So basically the result is not, it's not that good. And for our method, the most important thing is that I think that evaluation time is negligible because we are using a deep neural network as a policy and as a controller, and we don't have to solve the online optimization which is need a lot of extensive computation. And also we show, uh, we're gonna show two real world examples. So the first example is a spacecraft rendezvous and the proximity operations. And autonomous rendezvous and the proximity operations 
as well as autonomous docking are listed as critical technologies needed to pursue a variety of future space missions. And we are using an air bearing test bag to actually to push air from bottom up to lift the robot to compensate the gravity to mimic the floating environment in the space. And regarding the spacecraft, it consists of onboard computer, which is basically do the deep neural networks inference and have the motor drive and duct the fence and the compressed air tank. So these two things are actually the actuator. So they push the air, okay, and to generate the force to move the spacecraft forward and the turning around. And this is a docking interface. So the goal is that this docking phase can go through this area without a collision with this obstacle and the docking with this target successfully. And since we don't consider the perception side, so we are using the fluorescence markers and the motion capture system uh, for the localization. Well, the dynamics of the spacecraft is actually super, super simple. It's nothing but a second order linear uh, dynamics. And the X, Y are the position and the theta is the angle, okay? And actually this task can be stated as follows. Well, the gray areas are called a key power zone. So it is unsafe. The spacecraft should never get into this area. Well, the, right, the white area is safe. So the spacecraft can adjust its orientation, speed, position, and move slowly. And if there's an obstacle, it also tries to avoid the obstacle. And finally, successfully dock with the target. Since the dynamics of the robot are so simple, it seems that it is not difficult to complete the mission. As we also compare with MPC, right, in the simulated satellite task, it has seemed pretty straightforward. For, for example, if you just use MPC, but in the practice, it's not easy. The mission has several stages and some weird constraints to satisfy. The first stage is called orbiting. The spacecraft adjusted the orientation to get into the docking core, okay? The green area here, or the colored area here, is the operation area where the spacecraft is expected to stay during this stage. It can get into the white area for some reasons or for some disturbances, but also it has the ability to come back to this green area. Well, the second stage is proximity operations. So in this docking corridor, okay, this colored area, the docking interface, okay, the right arrow here should adjust to be vertical to the target. Well, on the third stage, okay, let's zoom in a little bit. And this spacecraft should move slowly, preferably in a straight line to dock with the target. Well, the green area here is the operation area. What it has to avoid the obstacles defined by this key power zone with this dash line. If you see that, actually, the constraint side of the key power zone is very weird. It's like a heart shape, right? So if you notice that mathematically, it's non-convex. So that's why model predictive control can hardly deal with such constraints. And if the simulated example, actually the constraint here is just a triangle. So it is convex. So the MPC can solve that efficiently. Okay, let me show a video, see how it works in practice and then compare with other methods. So we are using the control layup and barrier function as a prior, and this is the obstacle. So as I showed, this is move very slow, and finally it is successfully stuck with the target. And it also we compare with some state of art artificial potential field, which is widely used for the spacecraft rendezvous and the docking, and it collision with the it can collided with the obstacle. And also one key problem with the artificial potential field is it can also stay at the local minima. Let's try it again. It's stuck at the local minima. And also we compare with the model for the show and see what happens. So at the very beginning, the system crashed. So the problem with analysis, I think the problem is that, okay, the control frequency is too high to compensate the, 
the heavy computational complex, the heavy computation uh, regarded uh, re, uh, re, uh, reduced from the uh, model predictive control. Okay, so I want to show one more example, which is non-holonomic non robot pushing. So why I show this example? Because I want to emphasize the importance of modeling the constraints. Well, with mobile robots increasingly being used in different fields, there are various scenarios in which the robots are expected to do additional delivery tasks, for example, pushing. So if the object is too large or too heavy for which a manipulator or a robot arm cannot push, so we can use the UGV to push. So we consider a wheeled mobile robot operating in a flight planner environment, which is required to push an object to a given goal location while avoiding obstacles in the environment. So typically we can write the system equation uh, for the robot with X and Y at the position and theta is the angle, and the V is the velocity, omega is the angular velocity. So the control input is the acceleration and the angular acceleration. And then we have to make some assumptions, for example, unified pressure distribution, line contact, quasi static motion, geometric and the mass of the object and the friction coefficient of all contact surface are known. So basically the idea is that the object should always stick in with the robot so they can never detach with each other during the moving. So the plan is that we want to compute the motion cone of the object, so which is a set of feasible object motions when pushed by the robot. And furthermore, we transform the object's motion cone to the robot's motion constraints. That is the relationship between the angular velocity and the velocity. Then we can generate the angular acceleration and acceleration as control input with constraint guarantee. Okay, let's see how, would, how we get. So by some derivations, so it's true that angular velocity and the velocity have such an inequality relationship and it can be used at constraint. And this capital O here is the motion cone of the object. But how to derive that? Well, well, this is a difficult task actually, because you're gonna derive the friction cones, individual generous friction cones, convex hull, and so on and so forth. And you generate the pushing, pusher wrenches and the force motion model, eventually we get a motion cone of the objective. So what I want to show here is that due to time limitation, probably I, I will not go to the details, but the idea is that, okay, sometimes you have to understand the application at your hand to derive the constraints. Well, maybe some of the assumptions will be violated so you can get some complicated constraints and our framework can deal with complicated constraints uh, for these situations. So let's see how it works in the practice. So the robot pushing without considering the contact constraints so easily is just a slip away. And if we consider the robot pushing with considering the contact constraint, so it can work pretty well. Now we add some more difficulty, which is the obstacle. Then it also can do the pushing with collision avoidance. Okay, that's it. So uh, uh, I introduced the uh, basic reinforcement learning for robot control, and we can offer uh, the safety certificate by constructing the value function as a Lyapunov function, maybe some barrier function, and so on and so forth. And there are actually some ongoing works I want to mention. So one is the model based reinforcement learning. So typically we are rarely have the mathematical model. We can only try to learn the model. And during the learning, we are using the we are using the information of the uncertainty of the parameters to get the policy search, which is more efficient. And furthermore, we want to unify these other reinforcement learning frameworks like inverse reinforcement learning, multi-agent reinforcement learning, imitation learning, exception learning, and so on and so forth. Then if we can inject, okay, the constraints or priors on these safe certificates, and there, there are gonna be a lot of applications for these frameworks. And furthermore, 
I just give a little bit introduce uh, introduction on the safety, safety certificate. So definitely there are some uh, further directions we can explore more on the fine green guarantees. However, there are some challenges, which is uh, critical. And also we mentioned a lot actually during the discussion with the faculties before this seminar. So one, I think the most important uh, issue or the challenge is the high dimensional state space, such as the visual input. Now I only consider like the state uh, of the robot, like a velocity, position, and so on and so forth. And how about the visual input? And also in my case, I'm using a motion capture system. So basically localization is not a problem. Then how to deal with the localization regarding from some sensor data and it captures that high dimensional data is a problem. And furthermore, we are doing the offline learning. Okay, how about online learning, like in the model predictive control in the dynamic environment? And of course, the last thing is the constraint modeling for the application at hand and for your particular interest. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bay, for the amazing talk. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's certainly, a certainly a very a great seminar. Yeah, so I think we have time for um, some questions from the audience. Please feel free to either type in the chat or just unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay, maybe I can start with a question. Very nice work. Um, so I guess one of the challenges in model based versus model free is kind of the sample complexity, right? You need to explore a lot to be able to come up with something as good as a model based approach. So in your setup here, uh, could you comment a little bit more on that? Yeah, th this is a very good question. And actually, um, we're kind of sneaky that uh, we're trying to assume that, okay, we can cover all the state space, and that we are can kind of can run the simulator for a long time, and we can get as much data as possible. But as you mentioned that, okay, the sample complexity is also an issue. Um, to be honest, we didn't consider that, but I definitely, I think uh, there are some work on um, the guarantee, like, okay, we can show some sample complexity uh, regarding some performance, uh, et cetera, et cetera, not only for the model based case, but also for the model free case, okay? And uh, I think this is for the future work and we can combine with other learning framework and showing that, okay, this is possible. And also, I think we can answer this. Uh, we can answer this question in this way. So typically, we're going to use the Gaussian process as the policy or as the value function. So there are a lot of research in the Gaussian process uh, community, like uh, uh, in the Bayesian world of the machine learning. So they're going to show the sample complexity by using some guarantee as well. So they're going to show if we have some data set and we assume some distributions that we can guarantee that okay, this sample complexity can be guaranteed. And the last, I think in the practice, I didn't show here, actually we're using verification. So verification is basically say, okay, you're gonna find some counterexamples that, okay, this counterexample can be added to the training set to further train your neural network or value function or policy, et cetera, et cetera. But definitely this is an important question. And I think uh, we should consider that. Okay. Uh... Okay, a uh, good uh, question from me. And uh, so thank you very much today for a great uh, seminar. Very nice, very interesting. And uh, for, you know, uh, uh, using Bayesian-based method definitely uh, had a want, great advantage of dealing with uncertainty. So have you uh, considered like a, a deep comparison between, for example, let's just focus on data-driven model-based method. For example, given a nonlinear system, like nonlinear time varying unknowns, and then, you know, you could observe everything, X and U, and then, you know, what, uh, 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 what is the, the advantage of basing this method over, for example, existing like a uh, Kuhlman operator that's then that direction, you know, basically that nothing, just introducing a uh, current, current changing function and to change the variable to be another domain, another subspace. You could use deep neural network or whatever that kind of nonlinear function. So do you have any insight on this kind of comparison for just uh, did a driven model based a different method? Yeah, so this is a very nice question. So actually I'm working on a Kuhlman operator as well. And it, <laughs> so I think I can answer this question. Mm -hmm. uh, so first of all, uh, by using the Bayesian method, I think this is actually, this is a framework. So basically for any method or for many machine learning algorithm, you can use in the Bayesian framework. 
basically formulated as a probabilistic interpretation of all the things, all right? So the one of the advantage of the Bayesian method is to inject the prior. Mm -hmm. So typically, okay, suppose we want to, to learn a model by using the Newton dynamics, we can derive the, all the F equals MA, okay? Mm -hmm. And suppose you want to learn F equals MA. So basically you want to uncover the natural laws from data. How can you, how can you, uh, how can you gonna do that? So typically we're gonna inject some of the priors. Like there is um, a lot of work recently on the physics inform something, something, deep learning, whatever. Mm -hmm. So basically they are trying to inject the priors or prior knowledge of the physics into the modeling process. So in that way, I think that's for sure, not only for scientific perspective, that you can send, you can have some scientific discoveries, but also uh, it is more generalizable. This is one thing. And the second advantage I think is that, okay, this is what we do. Uh, this is what I, what I did before uh, for my PhD thesis regarding system notification using sparse priors. So sparsity is very important in system notification. And also in the Kupman operator modeling, they also use sparse in sparsity in the regular uh, regularization, right? So if you have a sparse model, so typically you can trade off or can avoid the overfitting problem. And by using the Bayesian approach, it is a natural regularization by injecting the sparse priors. So you can get a sparse model and you can get less overfitting problem. Okay, this is the two uh, main issues that uh, the advantage of the Bayesian method can offer. And the third, is actually you could combine the Bayesian method for the modeling with the Bayesian reinforcement learning. So as I said, there's no exploration and exploitation dilemma. So you can use the uncertainties of the parameter to get a policy search. And this is, there's a well-known uh, work on, which is called a PILCO uh, from uh, Carl Rasmussen in Cambridge and the Marshall Desson also from UCL. So they are trying to learn the dynamics as a Gaussian process. So the Gaussian process can be used explicitly as a closed form in the value function to get a policy search. So this is a very nice. And how they gonna update the search that you are using the uncertainties of the parameter. So this is very nice. And at the fourth point, I actually I want to mention, if you are doing like a perception task, you want to build a neural network for computer vision, okay? So this is a Bayesian method, actually this is from our work, we can do the Bayesian compression, okay, of the neural network, so which can be deployed in the uh, low computational uh, required platform like as PGA and so on and so forth. So this is a, something uh, we are quite liking or in favor of the Bayesian learning. Yeah. Oh, that, that's uh, very nice, especially the last item you mentioned. And if you guys could do this compression, that's you know, uh, very impressive. We'll definitely follow up with you uh, after the seminar. Thank you, Shoshan. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Pan, I have a question. If Hi. you can hear me okay. Yes. Um, I, I was wondering um, what the, uh, how big your uh, matrices were for the covariance terms in your uh, example earlier. And the reason I ask is because I have a project I work on where I have a Yashian process with lots of tiny matrices. It's been kind 20, of curious. Uh, 20,000. Oh, 20,000. Okay. Yeah. That's expensive. Okay. Yeah. That's expensive. Yeah. So basically okay. we update as follows. So basically uh, within some initial state, we're going to sample this size. Okay. When it goes on, goes on and comes to a different state, we're going to sample 2000 again. So basically we don't always use these 2000 examples. We just use that at initial point. So afterwards we just store, I mean, this is alpha, right? Just the alpha is a vector, right? So we can just use the alpha afterwards. So we don't have to access always to this 20,000 data set. Okay, that's the, that's the a trick we are using. So that's why you show the uh, inference time is uh, like one millisecond compared with MPC. Okay, that's very cool. Thank you. I was curious. Any other questions from the audience? All right, so if, if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker once again for the great talk. It was amazing to have you here, very fun. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Very nice to discuss with you. And uh, if you have any further questions, you can email me. And uh, if you 
uh, have uh, some requests for the papers or the slides, and just send me email. 